Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Turn in your Bibles, please, believe it or not. 2 Peter chapter 1. How do you like that? After 25 messages and nine months, we are finally in the book of 2 Peter. You say, Pastor, where does that line up where you expected to be in the series? The answer is, well, it doesn't. But that's okay because we're not necessarily trying to preach through the Word of God to get to a certain point in the year, but we're trying to preach in the Word of God to find something be done inside of us. And so we're glad to be able to be in Second Peter this morning. And I will say uh, a great deal of sickness going through the church right now in many different areas. And so just make sure to keep uh, one another in prayer. But I also do want to say at the same time, uh, it's good to have Diane with us here this morning. And so she may not be in playing the piano, but she's in the building and I'm thankful for that. And so uh, praise the Lord. I'll just tell you, um, you know, Vince is not a very good looking piano player. Did I mention that already? Already, uh, but uh, I just keep saying it because I just want it. It needs to be said. But at the same time, uh, we're thankful that uh, he's up there pressing the keys so that we can have music, and we're certainly glad that Diane is here. So, well, Second Peter chapter uh, number one, and we are looking at Peter in a message that I have entitled this. Hey, folks, it's Peter again. Because think about this: this is another letter that Peter has written to some people who, well, you know what I'm going to say because we've said it several times over the past year so far, haven't we? Scattered saints, some people who have gone through some great difficulty. And we're going to see in just a moment that probably about two years or so has passed between the writing of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And let me ask you this, do you think their plight has gotten any better? The answer is no. Uh, Nero is still emperor. Uh, the persecution of Christians is still real. And so because of that, Peter feels the need to be able to write a letter again by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to communicate several different things to these scattered saints. And I really want us to get right into our text this morning. We're only going to go through the first three verses, and I want to show you why this letter was necessary who Peter is writing to in a little bit more specificity, and then also uh, how there was some differences, although these people were being persecuted and there were some great difficulties, those difficulties are coming from a little bit of different quarters than maybe we would expect. So without all that being said, let's stand for the reading of God's Word, Second Peter chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and, our, and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, understanding that this is the beginning of a letter, you might look at these first three verses and say that these are just introductory remarks with maybe not a lot of real life application to where we are. And that might be true when we write letters to people, that the first sentence or two is just kind of an opener. We're introducing ourselves or maybe just saying some pleasantries to begin. These first three verses are filled with doctrine. They might be an introduction. It might just be the opening of something greater that's going to take place. But there's some pretty great things for us here in these first three verses. And I want to dig into those in a message again that I've entitled, Hey folks, it's Peter again. Why don't you be seated and then we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today, needy people. Lord, I come before you as a pastor, as, as needing your touch as much today as ever. And so I do pray that you would allow me to be able to say what needs to be said. I pray for those who are ill, who are traveling, who are not here today, and some of whom may even be watching this live stream right now, listening on a podcast. I pray your blessing upon them to be able to give them the health, and wherewithal that they need to be able to join us back in this assembly very soon. But Lord, for those who are here today, we need to hear from you. We came here not just to say we came, we came because we want to grow. And I pray you'd help us to do so this day. And I do pray that there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Savior, someone who's watching this, that is not sure about their salvation, that they would take care of that issue before it is eternally too late. And we ask this all humbly in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, before we get too far in our text this morning, I believe a bit of background is necessary to explain what's ahead in this second epistle. Now, I will say to you right at the get-go, this is the final book. These are the final words that we have from Peter by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That it seems that he understands that his life is about to be taken away. In fact, if you drop down to verse 13, look at verse 13 and 14. It says, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. What's a tabernacle? It's a temporary dwelling place like a tent would have been, even in the Old Testament, that the house of God was a tabernacle, a tent that moved from place to place before uh, the temple was taken place. And so here's what Peter says, this temporary dwelling place that I have, this outer shell that I inhabit right now, it's about to be taken from me. He understood that he was living under the shadow of death. And again, According to tradition, the Apostle Peter was martyred in Rome during Emperor Nero's persecution of Christians around 68 AD. It is said that he was crucified upside down at his own request, feeling unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus, right side up. Now, this account is based on historical writings and not what we find in the Word of God, but nonetheless, we could look at Peter, who we met in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And we can look at Peter, who we have been reacquainted with in 1 Peter, and now reading once again in this final letter in 2 Peter, and we see a different man. What's the difference? I think we could point to the book of Acts and see when he was empowered by the Holy Spirit and allowed the Holy Spirit to work through him when he became effective in his ministry, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but was effective in ministry because what God had done in his life and availing himself to the power of the Holy Spirit. So with this upside down crucifixion looming, he had one last letter to convey to convey, rather, and there is a new threat to the scattered saints. In the first book, we saw that it was the fact that there was persecution. And again, that persecution has not abated. That persecution has not gone, gone away. But as we look through Second Peter, we're going to see something incredible, that now there's going to be difficulty and disheartening that comes not from without, but from within. Say, within, pastor. No, false teachers that are rising up in the midst of those churches who are trying to teach heresy apart from the Word of God and teaching doctrine about the end times that needed to be corrected. And so we find that not only are they being persecuted from without, but there's also trials and tribulations that are taking place from within. And he wants to inform them and he wants them to be aware of this new threat. It's interesting to me that 1 Peter deals with discouragement that came from outside the church, and then 2 Peter deals with discouragement that can come from inside the church because the Apostle Paul actually warned of this very same thing taking place in a few different texts. For instance, Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, and we referenced his speaking at Ephesus just recently. But consider this as he speaks the Apostle Paul. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, sparing not the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after him. What does he say? There's going to be problems from without, and there's going to be problems from within. 2 Corinthians 11, 26. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen. He's talking about all the difficulties he went through in his life. In perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. That's a lot of peril, isn't it? That's a lot of difficulty. Could we put it this way? Coming from without. But then he finishes that verse by saying this. In perils from false brethren. He says there's also going to be some problems that come from inside the church as well, from false teaching and false preaching. So with the understanding of what is ahead, Peter wants to strengthen the people in who they believe, what they believe, and why they believe it. In who they believe, 
what they believe and why they believe it. I'm very certain this morning, well, I should be as certain as I possibly can, uh, just as a human being who can't read anyone else's minds and everyone who's happy with that should say amen, that I can't read your mind and thank the Lord you can't read my mind. Uh, but I will say this, that I'm probably amongst people who know who they believe and what they believe, but maybe not why they believe it. Maybe that can't identify in the Word of God why Jesus Christ is Lord. They can't identify in the Word of God why we are not living in the tribulation period right now. They cannot identify uh, what these key doctrinal ideas are because they have very practical effects in our daily life. And so Peter, in the same manner to these people, says, I need to give you a better foundation. I need to strengthen you because there is some false teaching that is out there. And this is why, here it is, they have to add to their faith. This is why they cannot remain stagnant in what they believe. And this is why, whether they were elder or whether they were younger in the faith, it was required of them to make sure they were moving forward for the cause of Christ. By the way, that's still true for us today. That whether you got saved in the last year or two, or whether you've been saved for 50 years or more, all of us need to add to our faith. All of us need to grow. None of us have arrived yet. You know when you'll arrive? When we arrive at the gate of pearl. We'll arrive when we are in that celestial city, but in the meantime, we haven't arrived, and every single one of us need to grow. And so Peter, understanding this background, understanding the false teaching, understanding how these scattered saints are now going to be tried by the difficulties they're having amongst themselves, there's a few things that he wants to make clear, and I believe he introduces them here in these first three verses. And really, it all comes down to this. Everything in our life depends upon our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. It all comes down to this. Everything that you hear me say for the next 30 or so minutes is going to come down to this. Everything in our life depends on our relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do you mean about everything? Everything. Well, how much? Everything. To what extent? Everything. Everything in our life is dependent upon our relationship of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that we see that goes along with that comes right from verse 1, and it's this, faith through Christ. Faith through Christ. Look again at verse number 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we preach through these verses very quickly on the very first message introducing the theme, Add to Your Faith, all the way back in January. So I'm not going to necessarily give you all the background to this verse, but I will say this. I do find it interesting as much today as I did back in January that Peter introduces himself as this, servant first and apostle second. As the writer of the letter, he realizes this. It's not really about my title. It's not really about who people see me as. It's really about who God sees me as, and that's as a servant, which is what God has called all of us to do. Uh, by the way, that's what we're to be, servants. That we don't ask questions. We don't say what we need to do or what we can do or what we can't do. If there's a need, we do it. And that's why, because we are servants. Here's Peter. He's a servant. And so he identifies himself, but then he identifies who he's writing the letter to. Because that's what you do with the letter, right? You say who you are, and you say who you're writing it to. So he says, Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He says that this letter is written to those who have obtained precious faith. Can we put it this way? Those who are saved. Those who know Jesus Christ, their Savior. Those who are born again. He says, I am writing this to those who are saved. And he says, how is this precious faith obtained? It's obtained through Christ. Faith must be obtained through Christ. Now, now, I want you to listen to something very carefully, and I may sound like I'm trying to be controversial, and I'm not, but I really want us to think through this process for just a second. When it comes to salvation, faith is not enough. Now, some of you are questioning. Some of you are thinking. Some of you are walking out. Come back. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, faith is not enough. Now, this may shock you. But it shouldn't. Faith in and of itself cannot save a soul. Now let me explain 
with an example, and then we'll go back to biblically why that's the case. Several years ago, before the Kia and before the Dodge Caravan we had, some of you are familiar with the Ford Explorer that we often nicknamed the Ford Exploder that we had. Uh, and it was not a great car. It, it just was not in so many ways. And if you like Ford, hey, you know, listen, you obviously have more faith than the rest of us now that I think about it, but that's okay. But, you know, I, it just did not work. In fact, we'd had Fords before. I grew up with Mercuries. Our family had Mercuries, which are basically undercover Fords and never had a problem. But it was this Explorer in particular that we had a problem with. And I remember the fact that it was just breaking down and it was having problems turning on, turning off properly. It had problems just going Anywhere it needed to go, you say, what was wrong with it? Everything. I mean, literally everything was wrong with it. And the day finally came when we were going to trade it in for our Dodge Caravan, and we were supposed to get, I think, $3,000 worth of trade-in value, and that must have only been for scrap metal because there was nothing in and of value of that. But I said, so what do we need to do to, to get this trade? He said, just get it on the lot. Just get it on the lot. I had faith that that Ford Explorer would make it to Route 3, to the dealership, to be able to trade in. There was one problem. My faith was misplaced. I got in the car. I turned it on. It was raining heavily because, of course. We know we can't go on the interstate. We're not going to make it on the interstate to go around Route 3 and to do all that. So we're driving through Brockton. We're going down back streets to be able to. We make it no further than Belmont Street, right in front of the VA. And what happens? It dies. And when I mean dies, I mean bury it. It's done. Have the service. I mean, this thing is not coming back. So we have to call AAA. And I'm standing out there in the rain trying to get all of these things situated. And it's embarrassing and it was awful. And I can tell you, you don't get a lot of trade-in value when you bring your trade-in on the back of a flatbed truck. You lose a lot of your negotiating power. It's just the way that it is. I had faith. But it was faith placed in something that didn't deserve it. And because of that, my faith was repaid with a consequence that I was not very happy with. When I say that faith in and of itself can't save you, listen, you can have faith in lots of different entities. You could have faith in lots of different gods. You could have faith in lots of different deities. But it's only faith in Jesus Christ that will save you. It is faith, but it's not faith alone. It's where is that faith placed? And it must be placed in Christ and in Christ alone to save you. Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. I was not shocked, but yet disheartened when I read just a few days ago that the Pope, making mention of salvation, talked in terms that all gods are the same God. And I read this quote for you this morning where he said, just days ago, all religions are a path to reach God. They are, I make a comparison, like different languages, different idioms to get there. But God is God for everyone. He continued, and since God is God for everyone, we are all children of God. And then he says, but my God is more important than yours. He continues, but is this true? There is only one God, and our religions, our languages, paths to reach God. Some are Sikh, some are Muslim, some are Hindu, some are Christian, but they are all different paths. Do you realize the absolute fallacy of that statement? That as long as you have faith in quote-unquote God that you're going to be okay, and that there's a moral equivalence between Jehovah God and Allah and Vishnu and the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods that were from the past or Satan himself who is worshipped by some, that all of them are simply paths to one generic entity who we call God. And as long as you put faith in just some physical force in heaven that you will be saved, friend, that may be faith. But that is even more misplaced than the faith that I had in my Ford Explorer. Faith 
must be placed in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you aren't sure that you're going to heaven someday, my appeal to you today is that today is a great day to get saved. To understand that you're a sinner, that it's only the blood of Jesus Christ which can save you. To call upon Him to save you today, to become born again. Listen, faith is through Christ. And what's the very basis of our text that we have here before us? What's the very basis of the book that we have before us here today? Faith in Christ. What's the basis of this fellowship that we have here? faith in Christ? What's this basis uh, that we have uh, in understanding that we have a home in heaven? Faith in Christ. Please, if you don't know, today is the day because you don't know that you have tomorrow. And you don't know that you will have that same conviction that the Holy Spirit is bringing into your heart right now about salvation. Come to Him today. Faith is through Christ. But I don't just see that from verse number one. Number two, I also see this, that there's grace and peace through Christ. It's not just faith through Christ, but there's also grace and peace through Christ. Now, look at verse 2 again. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, before we get too far here, let's be clear about something. There is a promise made, but it's only to a particular people. This promise is grace and peace be multiplied. What are those next two words? Unto you. Let's try that again. What's those next two words? Unto you. Okay, good. This is the audience participation part. All right, thank you. Unto you. Now, who's the unto you? We just saw it from verse 1. It's those who are saved. So he says, for those who are saved, grace and peace are multiplied. Now, you might say, well, pastor, can't the unsaved have grace? And the answer is there is some level of grace that is extended to the unsaved. The fact that before you got saved, you kept drawing breaths. The fact that your heart kept beating long enough for you to trust Christ as your Savior, that's the grace of God, friend. Make no mistake about that. And I would even point this out in a biblical sense, Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that be bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The fact that we are called unto salvation is a very sign of the grace of God, even when we're unsaved. But pastor, can't the unsaved have peace? Well, certainly. The unsaved have times and seasons where they have peace. I'm not saying that their whole life is nothing but turmoil and difficulty from cover to cover. There are times of peace. Is there eternal peace? Certainly not, unless they accept Christ their Savior. But is there grace to the unsaved? There is. Is there peace for the unsaved? There can be. But again, what does our text say? It says grace and peace be what? Multiply. So to us... Those who are saved, grace and peace is what? It's multiplied. Not only but you, but I like multiplication, at least in the right type of sense. Uh, do you have investments? You might like multiplication. You have a savings account? You'd like the multiplication of compound interest. A farmer appreciates the multiplication of crops, which brings greater seeds than what they put in the first place, which brings a greater harvest the next time. The baker appreciates multiplication as they use just that small amount of yeast, which makes a large amount of bread, which if they use that yeast and use that starter long enough, can make bread after bread after bread and loaf after loaf after loaf. Multiplication in and of itself in many situations is good. Now think about this. Try grace and peace multiplied. And that's what's available to the believer. A abundance or a superabundance of grace and mercy. But I would say this, it's not available for well, it's available to every believer, but it's not going to be taken by every believer. Because it's true for particular people, but it's true for particular people on a particular path. And that requires us to look at verse two again. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through. Okay. So let's stop there. That means this. Grace and peace are available for those who are saved, but through something. So imagine that there's a tunnel, and there's one side and then the other side, and we realize that if we want grace and peace that's on the other side of the tunnel, we have to go through the tunnel. And you're not going to get to the other side of grace and peace unless you go through that which is before you. Well, what do we need to go through? Well, it says, through the knowledge of God 
and of Jesus our Lord. Where can a person find grace and peace? Where can a person who is saved find grace and peace be multiplied in this day and age? It's in the knowledge of our God. Because the more we know God and the more we learn of God, the more we can rest on God and the more we can lean on God and the more that He can take our burdens and He can take our hurts and He can take our difficulties. But we have to know Him. Paul says, I want to know Him. The power of His salvation. But even Christians try to find grace and peace in all the wrong areas. Instead of looking through the knowledge of God. Medicine can give you sleep, but it doesn't give you rest. You can find sleep in a bottle, you can't find rest. Lust can satisfy longings until the craving comes back even stronger than it did before. Exacting revenge can fulfill a deep-seated hatred, but it never really brings closure that it promises. The world keeps telling us, do this, try this, buy this. Have some of this and you will have grace and peace. And friend, the only way we can truly have lasting grace and peace that's multiplied in our life is this, through Jesus Christ. And the knowledge of Him. The more you know Him, the more grace and peace you realize in your life. The more you know Him, the more you recognize grace and peace in your life, even in the midst of the storm and even in the midst of great difficulty. Do you know what brings peace and grace? It's not what, it's who. It's Jesus Christ. Where are you looking for grace and peace today? If it's anywhere other than from Jesus Christ, you'll be sorely disappointed. Remember, everything in life is dependent upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. What do we see here in this introductory statement? We find faith through Christ, number one. Number two, we find grace and peace through Christ. And if that wasn't enough... Number three, are you ready for this? All things through Christ. All things through Christ. Look at verse number three. According as His divine power hath given unto us, how many things? All things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. All things that pertain to life and godliness. It makes me think of James 1.17, which says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Listen, what we see here is that anything good that you can say is in your life, anything good that you have received upon your life, anything that is good and right and just, there's only one place it came from, and it's from Jesus Christ. And it really comes down to this. Jesus is enough. It's not about having a certain amount of money in your bank account. It's not about having career achievements. It's not about accolades. It's not about having a perfect family that fits exactly the way that you thought it would be when you started out with a family many years ago. No, it really all comes down to this. Jesus Christ is enough. And if you're not sure about that, Think about the inverse or the opposite of that statement. Jesus Christ is not enough? I think we would all agree with the idea that Jesus is enough. But if you're not sure about that, would you argue that Jesus Christ is not enough in your life? Now, really, when you think about it, what we need is really not what we think we need a lot of times. I mean, we live in the United States of America. You want to talk about superabundance. We have received a superabundance in our life. The fact that we have air conditioning and heating in most of our homes. The fact that most of us drove here today in vehicles that are more computer than machine. That have more complex computational power than what they sent people to the moon on that you and I have pantries that sometimes people can walk into and that we have grocery stores filled with food and even in times when there is not access to food in the sense that maybe someone's struggling that even in our country we've been blessed to be able to have 
organizations and places that will help people get food many times. And even the government, and we can make a lot of arguments about how the government has made things much more difficult, but to make access for people to have some of those things that in other countries they would not be able to have. We have been blessed. We've been blessed. But what do we really need? Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6. You need to eat. You need a drink. You need clothing. You need a roof over your head. And has God supplied all of those things for us? And so much more. Now, he's enough, friend. And if you think he's not enough, then we have missed the mark on what we truly think we need. And let's be honest, God's not just given us our needs, He's given us a lot of wants. We talk about eating and drinking and clothing and housing, but God has given us a whole lot more than that. But who gave it to us? Well, I worked hard. Sure you did, but God gave it to you. Well, I've got a great job. That's tremendous, but God gave it to you. Well, it's by the sweat of my brow. God gave you that sweat and He gave you the brow. He gave it all to you. Matthew 6, 28 through 32. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow it's cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all of these things. And we get ourselves in trouble when we forget this truth that God will provide every good and every perfect and every right thing in our lives. You see, I almost feel like the first two points are the easier points. And that might sound strange to you. But when it comes to salvation, when you're truly thinking right about salvation, you realize, I can't save myself. I mean, when I started thinking right about my condition with the Lord, I realized there's nothing within me that can get myself to heaven. There's nothing within me that can cleanse me from the stain of sin upon my life. It's only Jesus. When it comes to grace and peace even, there's an understanding that truly those are things far beyond our capacity. And even more, the more so when we try to find peace in our life, sometimes it seems even more elusive. And that's why we have peace through Christ, the peace that passes all understanding. That's what the Holy Spirit can give us, even in the midst of difficulties and storms. But this issue of all things, this is where I think we get a little too comfortable. Because it says, according to His divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And I do think we get to the point in our Christian life where we think some of the good things and the blessed things that we have have something to do with us. That we forget that grace is still grace and that God's power is still God's power. And once again, we see that all of this is accessed through what? The knowledge of God. The answer to everything and for everything is in Christ and His Word. By the way, going along with this same thought, do you know every problem that you have in life, God has given you His Word to be able to help? I'm going to say that again because maybe you don't believe that or maybe you've never thought of that. God has given you everything you need, everything that pertains to life and godliness, in His Word. His Word is sufficient for the problems of your life. Some things he's given to us explicitly, meaning this, he has named it and he has said, this is what you do or this is what you do not do. And it's explicit in the word of God. There are some things that are implicit, meaning this, it may not speak of it in specificity. For instance, we don't find the internet anywhere in the Bible. I mean, can you imagine Peter saying, hey, this email is sent to you by the, Apo no, we don't get that, you know. They found this epistle on X, you know, or Twitter or whatever it's called tomorrow. Who knows? No, the Internet. But do we find principles helping us make sure that we use the Internet rightly from the Word of God? What we put before our eyes? 
to make sure that we read things that are only good and healthful and helpful in our Christian life, which you can find some of those things online, like sermons and like good teaching and access to good books and those kind of things? Absolutely. But are there principles all throughout the Word of God that are found implicitly about the Internet? Absolutely. Do you realize anything that you have in your life that is a need, the answer can be found in God's Word? But we get to the place where the knowledge is not of God, the knowledge is of ourselves or what we've accumulated over time from going to church. And what we end up doing is we look everywhere but the one place that has the answer, God's word. How foolish of us, yet how human of us to be able to do that. A.J. and Peyton have a favorite song, one of their favorite songs. And it, it's, it's one, I'll be honest with you, it just suck the soul right out of you. I mean, it just, it's... It's just really, really tough to listen to. And it's called The Duck Song. How many of you know The Duck Song? Have you heard of this? All right, good. My wife. Okay, Anthony, I've got questions for you after church. All right. Oh, you've played it here before. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Is that like a prelude? All right, so, um, but uh, The Duck Song. Uh, the, the Duck Song is very simple. It's about a duck, a talking duck. All right, I mean, we get that out of the way. All right. Uh, he walks up to a lemonade stand and he goes to the man who's selling the lemonade and he asks him, do you have any grapes? All right, Abby, is this resonating with you? All right, good. Yes, this is good. She's like, I just listened to that on the way to church. All right. Um, but uh, every day he goes up to this man and he asks him for grapes every day. And the man gets more and more frustrated because he says, we don't have grapes. We're a lemonade stand. Why are you asking for lemonade? Or why are you asking for grapes at a lemonade stand? And the, end, the song ends up with like a silly ending where he ends up uh, going to a place where uh, they'll give him grapes and he goes there and he asks for lemonade instead because, you know, that's just the way that it is. And then and AJ goes again, again, again. That's like, uh, I wish I was deaf. All right. So, but anyway, and I might be if I keep listening to this. So the idea is this duck is so foolish because he keeps going to a place where they do not sell grapes and ask for grapes. And, you know, for a kid's song, it's like, okay, that's cute, that's funny, whatever. You know, I was thinking about this, a spiritual application to a song that you would think has no spiritual application. How many times do we go looking for answers in all the wrong places? That we go to the world and say, do you have an answer for the confusion that I have? And if they were honest, they'd say, why are you asking us? We're confused. Do you have an answer for the anxiety that I have? Say, why would you ask us? Because we're full of anxiousness. Do you have an answer for the addictions that we have? And they say, well, why do you think we're the one that helps create those addictions? Do, do you have an answer for the bitterness that's within my heart? And they'd say, well, we operate on bitterness. We don't know the answer to that. Do you have an answer for how I can raise my family? And they'd say this, we don't even know what a family is. We don't even know what a man or a woman is. And I wish that was hyperbole, but that's not. That's what the world would tell you today. That we couldn't even give you a definition of what a man or what a woman is. But yet, we keep going to them asking them for help. And we keep going to them asking for answers when, listen, Jesus says, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. I've given you everything you need in my word and in his sufficiency as you grow in the knowledge of God, I will give you all things. If you can trust him for your salvation, if you can trust him for your afterlife, then you should trust him with your life. But sometimes it's almost easier to trust him with the afterlife because we know we can't do it and we can't see it. But trust him at work tomorrow? Trust him at school? Trust him in my family situations? Trust him with my doctor's appointments. Uh, trust him with my issues that I have that no one even knows about. Well, listen, I know who does know about them. And it's not a duck. It's not a guy to lemonade stand. And it's not the world. It's Jesus Christ. He has the answers. All things in our life. All things in our life depend upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. I could go back, as we conclude, back to John chapter 15. I won't for the sake of time, but what did we read last week? We must be attached to the vine. You know why? Because from the vine comes all 
nutrients and nourishment and growth. Who is Jesus Christ? If you try to do anything in your life apart from Jesus Christ, it will end in failure. Say, well, pastor, I just don't feel that way because I see a lot of people out there who are pretty successful and they even have a lot of money and they seem like they're pretty happy and pretty content. And I'll spot you, maybe they are. But I will tell you, there will come a time in a method very similar to a rich man and Lazarus who one received all of his good things in life and the other had the dogs lick his sores. And you would say, that rich man, he had it all. He took life by the, by the very uh, 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 best, and he took it for himself. And, and this other man, I mean, what a miserable life. What a rotten life he lived. His best friends were the dogs that ran feral through the streets. Well, I'll tell you, there was one who was screaming to God in torments. Right. And the other who received his good things in the afterlife. You know why? Because everything in life depends on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you struggling today? Are you having difficulty? Is life not what you think it could or should be? I want to remind you that it's not just Jesus for faith. And it's not just Jesus for grace and peace. It is Jesus for all things. All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. There's some people that are going through some pretty hard times here. And there's some people going through some pretty hard times here. And who are going through some pretty hard times out there. The answer is this, Jesus Christ. Do you think it's that simple? If it's that simple for salvation, it's that simple for any other issue in our life. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.